I was not very familiar with uh, animation um, prior to this project coming my way, but uh, my boyfriend is a huge Japanime fan and uh, was very excited at the prospect that I was going to be working with Atomo and filled me in on you know who he is and uh, we watched uh, Akira, his other, his sort of like I think probably one of his most famous movies I guess, at least to American audiences. Um, and it's incredible, and I, you know, I became a fan. All the suffering of humanity, the ages of misery and darkness, science can change that. But what use is it if we don't bring its power to everyone? The entire world is waiting for the power of Steam Castle! Some of the, some of the kind of adult-themed anime stuff that's going on, the sort of more grown-up stories, there's some wonderful work being done, you know, and it's, uh, but, it, but it's, it seems to be that the area, you know, you've got to be a real kind of enthusiast to kind of go and find where it is. You know, it, it doesn't play in your, in your local cineplex. For you are the heir of the Steam family. You alone. You know right from wrong. Never let go of that. And do not give the treasures of science to the greedy, the wicked. You must preserve the future for all of us. I have in the last few, only in the last few years, I'm embarrassed to say, become much more aware of Japanese animation and I was lucky enough to spend some time in Japan earlier this year and I'm, I'm just blown away by it. It's very different from what we've been doing in the West. Uh, I mean, for instance, in this film, <clears throat> there are no talking animals. You know, there, there are no, you know, cute moments. It, it, it's, it's all about uh, human beings, 19th century human beings, there's, there's nothing odd or weird in that respect. And so it's, it's like being in a contemporary drama, except it has a period setting. And um, so it's very, very naturalistic. I, I wanted to do this film because it's totally different. You know, it's, it, first of all, I'm playing a, a boy and uh, getting to do all this sort of action stuff that, you know, girls never get to do in live action film. And because of, you know, obviously, Tomo's reputation as like you know an animator he's sort of revered by like all these people and it's always fun to be part of a project that people will be sort of eagerly anticipating it you know it coming out because of you know the person has such respect from from their fans I was I was asked uh, basically if I wanted to you know if I'd ever done a um, the voice for a full length animation feature and I've never done it before the only the only work I mean, I've done little bits and pieces here and there on voiceovers and I've recorded books on tape and that kind of thing but this on this sort of scale I've never done it before so it struck me as a as an interesting sort of new experience you know to to, to sort of flesh out a character just with the voice and the fact that the character was already drawn and 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 you know, made sort of real, as it were, you know, visually, to then find a way into that, you know, and find the voice for it. I just thought it was a, an interesting process, not too scary. I've been very fortunate in the last few years to be involved in a, a number of animated feature projects, and they've all been interesting in their way, but this has been particularly fascinating as well as very challenging too. The uh, the, the character that I play, Lloyd, is uh, fully established. He's a three-dimensional character because the Japanese version of the film is completed. So I'm coming in with a lot of the work already done and therefore having to fit my voice to the character that already exists. Our dream is dead. It's time to go. It's, it's somewhat easy for me That's because he's from Manchester, this character. And I'm just a few miles east of there. And um, so that, that was comfortable. But, but you're, having to find, you're having to find a vocal uh, uh, characterization that absolutely fits, blends perfectly with a, a character that's already there on screen. And um, there's so much intensity in in the scenes that I'm in, that it's, it's been really quite challenging. There, that'll stop your game. We'll go down in the Thames as planned, Eddie! Uh, I got involved in, with Steam Boy because I was uh, hired to cast it. 
and uh, then they considered me as a director as well. I had worked with the company on some television projects in the past, so they asked me and I saw a, a VHS copy of it and I said, I, I love this project and I, I love the story. Um, it's not uh, like a cartoon, it's an animated movie, it's a real film and we're treating it like a live action movie and uh, getting involved in that kind of a film was very exciting. I was I jumped at the chance. And uh, the fact that it was a very sophisticated kind of animation, which is almost film-like. You know, I mean, there was one point when we were when we were doing the recording that I, I remember saying, "Well, why didn't they just make a movie? It would probably have been easier, you know." But but the art and the skill of it is um, really quite impressive. What in the world is? With every project, I do something that I haven't done before, something that is going to be a new skill or something that will stretch, you know, stretch my abilities in some way. And putting the voices and life into animated characters, particularly ones that were not originally animated in English, is pretty challenging and is actually really fun. Uh, Ray, sir. James Ray Steam, sir. Mr. Stevenson, sir. James Steam? Ah, Dr. Steam's son. Plus, as a girl playing a 13-year-old boy who's involved in lots of action, you never get to do that in real live action film. The boys obviously always get all the fun and the action. And, you know, even if you're a girl in an action movie, which I've done twice with the X-Men movies, um, you're still never really as involved in all the really crazy, like, physical stuff. So it's kind of fun to get to uh, do it, even if it's just your voice, to get to do it, um, to be that in a movie. <laughs> Plus, it was just seen, it seemed so funny to me that I'm playing a 13-year-old boy from Manchester and I'm a 22-year-old woman from New Zealand. It just was so kind of like, it's like, well, why not? I look for work that's interesting. And w with that, if there is a challenge attached to it as well, and something which is, uh, in as many ways as possible, unlike anything that I've done before. Huh? Oh. It's no good, but Eddie! It's too dangerous. The main valve can't take any more pressure. What? You want to give up now and just throw it away? Open all the valves, everyone! <laughs> He's gone mad. Casting was very extensive for Steam Boy. We did talent search uh, all over the country lot in LA. We had casting in England, in Manchester, where the movie actually takes place, which was really exciting. And uh, of course here in London. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the voices were authentic regionally, uh, were authentic in terms of that voice could come out of that body, uh, that the, the feeling of the sound uh, was similar to the Japanese counterpart, so there was a lot going on and it took a very long time. Anna Parkin and Alfred and uh, Patrick Stewart were so great, I was amazed and uh, I'm, I'm very honored to work with them. This exhibition allows us to reveal them to the entire world. Good thing. Yeah, playback with the uh, 615. Probably this is uh, uh, the first time the Japanese, I don't know, some kind of directors uh, I could work with uh, those kind of good actors directly, you know. So I, I'm very, very much proud of this opportunity. Okay, we're going to do a take on this. Here we go. So let's uh, shoot Q1521 again, please. Good. I'm lucky in that two of the closest characters to my character in this film, my son, and my grandson are both played by actors who I know and who I've worked with. Fred Molina plays my son, and Anna Paquin, who I know, of course, from X-Men 1 and X-Men 2, plays my grandson, and very convincingly, too. Uh. 
all the characters are known just by their first names. And uh, he's the son of a, a, of, a, of a, a scientist, and they're both scientists, and they've been working together on this on, on harnessing steam, which and the whole sh the whole movie takes place at the turn of the 20th century, when steam was the sort of you know the nuclear power of, of its day, and they have a difference of opinion in terms of where they need to go with this, both scientifically and ethically, and they have a, a, a parting of the ways. And that's where Eddie's journey starts. He he kind of goes off in a direction that um, other people, including his father, find questionable. And into this mix is Eddie's son, who becomes involved in this uh, conflict between the father and the grandfather, and effectively is the is the catalyst for the uh, f f for the resolving of, of the story. What about you and Granddad? You must come as well. Forget about those land. Just get out of there. I can't leave you. We're in this together. Stop wasting time, would you? If you don't hurry, we're all going to die. No way. In terms of playing a boy, um, it's for the most part, my speaking voice isn't incredibly high anyway. But it's times when there's any kind of emotion or sort of more like screaming or yelling or effort noises that. I'll start to sound very, very feminine because it will sound a little more kind of like whiny and pathetic as opposed to kind of like this tough, scrappy little boy. And sometimes I do have to make, you know, a conscious effort to I'll get note, you know, okay, that was great. Now, <laughs> lower register, please. lay down each actor's track individually and then luckily for me um, s some of the other characters uh, particularly Alfred Molina had already done his work by the time I came in so for scenes where I'm supposed to be acting opposite him I actually get to hear his voice come you know coming out of the mouth so that you know I can sort of kind of match performance with his if you know what I mean so it feels a little bit more like you're really acting um, opposite someone as opposed to just, you know, empty, uh, empty mouths. That's the one odd thing about this kind of work is that you do, you do work sort of on your own. You know, I, don't, I don't think it happens very often when you have like two or three actors in a room. But, um, you know, but you, but you hear them and you hear, you know, so you get a sense of, of where they're going with their roles. This exhibition allows us to reveal them to the entire world. Too strong. Too strong. Much more subtle. <laughs> Let's go to page 114. 114. So you're talking right. into the uh, right. talking tube, speech tube, they call it. Right, thank you, thank you, thank you. I have so much input from, from you know, our director, who, Rick Seif, who you know, obviously knows the project very intimately and can help with um, making sure that you are where you need to be, sort of like emotionally and whatever, and knows what the other performances are kind of going to need to be like. To, so um, you can kind of fill in the blanks a lot for you. The work that we're doing here matches most ADR sessions. If I were doing ADR or additional dialogue replacement for a film that I had shot, I would be lip syncing to my own face, to my own uh, dialogue. In this, I'm lip syncing but it's to an animated character, but to an animated character speaking Japanese. So you're never going to get exactly perfect sync with it. It's over, Eddie. Give up. The steam castle is about to explode. As an ADR director, uh, I have to kind of keep a few balls in the air. I want to make sure the performance is what it needs to be. I want to make sure that it syncs well, even though uh, the editors and folks afterwards are going to really fit it perfectly. Um, I want to make sure that the character stays intact. If the person hasn't recorded for a day or two, that the voice matches what they were doing a couple days ago. Uh, and that within that scene, that line reading makes sense. So when you play a scene that's two or three minutes long, uh, it flows and tracks, as we call it, naturally. There's nothing ambiguous about this kind of work. You know, it's not like you can, when you're doing something where you're being seen, you can play a moment or a, 
a beat in the story and you can do something with your voice that isn't necessarily the the, the expected thing but with this kind of work it you, you don't want that you want it the voice has to be absolutely precise about what's going on well the script that we're working with on this film is very very well thought out with regards to matching the words with the mouths. I mean, someone's obviously spent a lot of time going over it very meticulously so that our job in the studio is made much, much easier. Obviously, there are some things that are a little, le that are a little less perfect matches with the, you know, the way the mouths move versus what the meaning has to be when it comes out in English words. Um, and there's sometimes a little bit of sort of juggling that needs to happen, but for the most part, um, it's been pretty. It's been pretty smooth. I'm supervising the dialogue itself. I, I have to advise uh, to read the the translation is uh, right or not. Those kind of things I do. Mr. K. Momose, who is the sound director, he was uh, in the in the Japanese version the casting director, the ADR director, the sound. He's the sound supervisor. He's uh, oversees all the music scoring, and something like two hundred thousand sound elements. I mean, it's an unbelievable uh, achievement in sound design. When you hear the inside of this steam castle where a lot of the movie takes place, it's this cavernous metallic. Uh, kind of place and uh, there are all kinds of creaking oiled up machines and it's it's a remarkable achievement in sound and he oversaw all that and has lived with the project for a long time science uh -huh. it must work to advance all of humanity Father! It's, it's unlike any animated features I've ever seen.